Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, please grab your Bibles again, and let's turn to the next part of Mark chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to read uh, from verse uh, 14 down to 23. And as you turn there now, um, let me lead us in prayer. And we'll pray that God will speak to us. And we'll pray that God would show us what it is that he wants us to hear from his word this evening and how he wants us to respond. So let me pray for us now. Father, our prayer, very simply, is that as we read your word, you would show us the state of our hearts and that you would show us your son, Jesus, who comes to rescue us. Help us to understand our sin. Help us to understand your salvation. And help us to respond with thankful obedience, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 7 then, verse 14 reads, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Well, as a church family, over the past few weeks on a Sunday evening, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark together. And we've been watching Jesus as he teaches those around him and as he demonstrates to those around him who he is and why he has come into the world. Mark wants us to see, Mark wants us to conclude that Jesus is the Messiah, the rescuer, and that Jesus is the Son of God, here to teach us about God's kingdom to save us from our sins. And over the past few weeks, we've heard Jesus teach us that there will be different reactions, there will be different responses to who he is and what he says. Some people will respond positively, others will reject him. And we've seen Jesus' miracles confirming and revealing that he really is who he says he is. We've seen his authority over nature we've seen his authority over sickness we've seen his authority over death itself and we've seen that the response that Jesus is looking for in any individual anyone who would listen to him is faith the best response the necessary response for anyone who hears the words of Jesus is to turn away from our sinful ways and to bow the knee to him as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And yet, just as Jesus predicted, we've seen already some hostility to Jesus and his message as we've looked at chapter 6 of Mark together. Jesus' family and his friends, they oppose the teaching of Jesus in their hometown. And then we see King Herod and his wife oppose the teaching of John the Baptist to the point where they would have him beheaded. And yet we also saw in Mark chapter 6 last week very clear evidence that despite the opposition that Jesus faces, his mission is not derailed. 
We saw that Jesus is the same redeeming God that rescues his people. The same God that did it in the Exodus of the Old Testament. The I am God that hears the cries, hears the, the cries of his people, has compassion on them and provides for them by feeding over 5,000 of them in a desolate place. And now as we move from chapter 6 into chapter 7, Jesus is in Gentile territory. We read that he crossed over the lake in verse 53 of chapter 6 to Gennesaret, a Gentile location where he is still more than able to perform miracles there, despite it being a place that would have been considered outside of the community of God's people. See, Jesus is continuing to reveal, continuing to demonstrate and teach everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, about who he is and why he came. Jesus' work, Jesus' gospel, they have no boundaries. Jew and Gentile alike are welcome into his kingdom. Jesus' forgiveness and restoration are not limited to one people group not bound by one geographical location, but he is willingly stepping over boundaries from Jewish land into Gentile land to be their savior king, as well as the savior king of the Jews. And that should be a moment of great joy. It should be a moment of real celebration as more and more people meet Jesus. They encounter his kingdom, but instead the Pharisees come to question Jesus about the conduct of his disciples. And once more, Jesus' warning about his word and his authority being rejected comes true. So there are two things for us to see this evening, and they should appear to my screen on, to this screen on my left. The first thing that Mark wants us to do this evening is to recognize the emptiness of external godless religion. Recognize the emptiness, the vain worship, to use Jesus' own words, of external godless religion. So we read at the start of chapter 7 that the Pharisees had gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, traveling a long, long way, it would seem, just to keep a very, very keen eye on what Jesus is doing and what he is teaching. And these Pharisees and the scribes, they see in verse 2 that some of Jesus' disciples eat with hands that are unclean. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And so they take their disgust straight to Jesus in verse 5. Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus, why do your disciples not listen to what we teach? It's a question that reveals so much about the Pharisees. It's a question that reveals so much about the state of their hearts. I remember at the start of the the calendar year when I was still in Edinburgh, I was catching up with a friend of mine who had gone home for Christmas. And he was telling me all about a particularly intense game of Uno that he and his family were all playing one evening around the table. And he said to me that when his family sit down to play Uno, Over time, over the years that they've played Uno, so many other rules have been added on to the game that they now play what is essentially an entirely different game to how Uno is supposed to be played. He told me that there are so many extra rules that they have added on to the game that it is unrecognizably different to how Uno should be enjoyed. He then went on to say, and I'll never forget him saying this. He then went on to say that if the creators of Uno were to walk in and see his family playing Uno together, the creators would be so appalled at what they had turned the game into. But he then said that, to be honest, I don't think my family would care. They wouldn't want to listen to what the creator of Uno had to say. And in a much, much more serious way, In Mark chapter 7 this evening, the Pharisees here have added on so many religious rules onto the laws of the Lord, onto the good commandments of God, that their own faith system 
is now an entirely different faith to the genuine living faith of following the good God that made us and loves us. The Pharisees here have added on so many other rules and traditions that what they teach now is unrecognizably different to Jesus' teaching on what it means to truly worship God. And as the Pharisees and the Creator meet one another, the Creator is indeed deeply upset at what they have done. So we read in verse 3 that the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. The Pharisees would have practiced and taught that if you had been in a place like the market, you could potentially be exposed to something unclean, something perhaps that has come from a Gentile land or a Gentile hand. So you were to wash your hands, you were to wash the cups, you were to wash the pots, you were to wash the couches, you name it. Just to wash away all of the unclean. And then they taught these rules, they taught these commandments as if they were the commandments of God himself. Let's be clear, these extra laws are not for purposes of hygiene. This is purely for purposes of external piety, to be seen to be holy by other people, in front of other people. See, what we have here at the start of Mark chapter 7 is a really tragic scenario where Jesus looking at the Gentiles, thinking they need to hear about the kingdom of God. is standing next to the Pharisees who are looking at the Gentiles and thinking, mm, let's wash our hands in case they make us unclean. And so Jesus calls them out for what they are. Verse six, he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. It's a very sad tale. It's one that spans hundreds of years back to Isaiah's day, where the religious authorities who were supposed to lead God's people down paths of righteousness, who are supposed to teach the commandments of God clearly in a way that encourages God's people to worship God in the way that he commands them to. Instead, they merely honor God with their lips, giving the appearance of godliness, but refusing to honor him in their hearts. Those who are supposed to be the leaders of God's people instead take the commandments of men the extra rules, the extra traditions, the extra teachings that they have come up with. And they teach it as if it were the commandment of God. And so three times Jesus says the same thing to the Pharisees. Verse 8, verse 9, and verse 13. Jesus says, you leave, you reject, and you make void the word of God, the commandments of God. And instead you hold, establish, and hand down the tradition of men. You might remember last week we read of Jesus' compassion for those he describes as those that are like sheep without a shepherd. And here we learn just how shepherdless these sheep truly, truly are. The effect of these additional rules, the effect of these additional laws, the effect of these additional traditions of the Pharisees is that they then push the true God, his good laws, his love for his people, his heart for his people, completely out of the picture. And the example that Jesus gives him there and then is Corban. So look with me at verse 10. Jesus says to the Pharisees, Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God. 
The law that God gave to Moses made it perfectly clear. Anyone is to honor their father or mother. But the Pharisees have set up this system, verse 11, called Korban, where you have agreed to donate all your possessions, all of your finance to the religious leaders when you die. So everything that you own is left to the temple, left to the Pharisees after you are gone. And that very same rule, Korban, means that in the meantime, if your father or your mother, whom you're supposed to honor, if they come to you and they need financial aid or they need support, you say, sorry, dad. Sorry, mom. I can't help you out because I've already made a commitment to leave all that I have, all that I own to the Pharisees and to the temple. Korban. Sorry. I'd love to help you out financially, but my hands are tied. Whatever I could give to you, well, one day it needs to go to the temple. So, sorry. And what does Jesus think of it? Verse 12. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And it doesn't end there. Many such things you do, says Jesus. That heart behind the law, the love, the compassion that God wants a son or a daughter to feel and to express and to show his struggling father or struggling mother, that is squeezed out by the commandments of men. And the commands that God has given are slowly eroded, slowly replaced over time by the teaching of man. Teaching that just so happens to be financially and reputationally profitable for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus says it is religion without God, godless religion. It is empty, and Jesus exposes it for what it is, hypocrisy, vain worship from those whose hearts are far from God, even if the Pharisees might look and sound pious to those who are watching on. Now, I think at this stage we can express a profound gratitude that Jesus calls out godless and false religion for what it really is. He exposes it for the dangerous deception that it really, really is. Jesus loves and upholds the godly teaching of the Old Testament. He does not love, nor does he uphold, the godless teachings of man. He doesn't try to find a compromise with the Pharisees. He doesn't agree to disagree. He will have none of it. He condemns their worship. He condemns their commands for what they are. And I'm extremely thankful, and God's people can be extremely thankful, that Jesus will not tolerate it. Instead, acting as the good shepherds, those that his people need, he steers us away from false teaching. He steers us away from anything that would squeeze God's command out of the picture towards that which is true and good, towards that which is really from God. And so as his people, we must not listen to anything that might sound good, that might even come from a source that we would think of as authoritative, if in reality it squeezes God and it squeezes his laws out of the picture. We must not teach it ourselves, and we must reject it in the same way that Jesus does. It's destructive, false worship, godless religion, and instead of allowing ourselves to be sucked into it, we must reject it, just like Jesus does. And so that's the first thing that Mark wants us to do as we look at these verses this evening, recognize the emptiness the vanity of godless religion. Secondly then, and with our remaining time, Mark wants us to recognize the necessity of an internal heart transplant. Recognize the necessity of an internal heart transplant. So verse 14, Jesus calls the people to him again and says to them, hear me all of you and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Jesus calls everyone, Jew, Gentile, religious leader, disciple, 
to hear the message that everyone so desperately needs to understand. Jesus says, the lines which divide clean and unclean, defiled and undefiled, those lines don't run across how clean or how dirty your cups or your dishes are. They don't run across what you have or haven't eaten, the company that you have or haven't been with. Instead, Jesus says, the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And Jesus explains to the disciples later in verse 18, that whatever goes into a person cannot defile him since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. In the sight of the Messiah King Jesus, in the sight of the Son of God, nothing to do with food laws is that which defiles us. What we eat just very simply passes through our body in time. Instead, Jesus says, what really does defile us is that which comes out of our sin-stained hearts. The list that Jesus mentions in these verses is a timeless description of every single human being who has ever lived. It's a description of the hard-hearted religious leaders of Jesus' day. And it's a description of the hard-hearted disciples who still don't understand what Jesus has really come to do. It's a description of the past hour of my life. It's a description of the past week of my life. And it's what I see in my heart every single day. Verse 21. For from within, Jesus says, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, Envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Jesus says the heart of every single human being is a factory. A factory of sinful patterns of thought. A factory of sinful patterns of behavior that run deliberately and directly in contrast to who our God is. Our God is good, our God is pure, our God is generous, and yet from our hearts we produce evil, sexual immorality, theft. Our God is the God of life, the God of truth, the God of love, and yet from our hearts we produce murder, deceit, slander. Our God is wise. A God who would humble himself to step into our world to rescue us. And yet from our hearts, we are foolish and we are proud. Every single sin produced by our hearts is an affront to who he is and an offense to his character. He has told us to be holy because he is holy. And we have said no. And we haven't just said no once. We've said no repeatedly. All of these evil things, Jesus says in verse 23, they come from within and they defile a person. And that is all of us sitting here this evening. All of our family and friends across St. Andrews, all of our family and friends across the world. And we have to understand just how serious our situation is. The consequences are severe. We are defiled by our sins. We are separated from a good and pure God. We're on a collision course with his judgment and wrath, which we fully deserve because of what we have done. And when we understand the depths of our sinful hearts, we realize just how ineffective the godless external religious attempts to clean ourselves really are. After I read that list, how could I possibly make myself right again with my God? that I have so brazenly sinned against by washing cups, by washing hands, by eating or avoiding certain foods. I might be tempted from time to time to think that way. We might be tempted from time to time to just arrange our own external religious traditions and rules around us that we've made up. 
just so that we look better than we actually are, just so that we might impress our gods with our man-made moral rules and regulations and how well we stick to them. We might even convince ourselves that if we try hard enough and stick to them closely, we can fix and forgive our own sinful hearts. I remember sitting with a really good friend of mine from university days as she protested that she was so sure that she would go to heaven because she stuck to her own moral code with, on the whole, a large degree of success. That by her standards, she hadn't done anything wrong. Not that badly wrong, at least. She hadn't done anything overly offensive. And I remember trying to explain to her that if we were to go by the worldly standards around about us of good and evil, clean and unclean, she could well be a good and clean person. And the moral and religious leaders of the year 2022 might even agree that she is. But the most important question is how she stood, how any of us stand against Jesus' analysis of our hearts. Once more, I am very, very grateful to Jesus for things as they are. Earlier on in Mark, we hear Jesus announce, it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus says that he has not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus does not expose our sinful hearts in these verses and then stand at a distance, leaving us without any hope. He says this as the God who has come into our world to deal with our sinful hearts, as the God who pleads with all of us to repent of our sins, to believe the good news of the gospel of forgiveness. Jesus, the Messiah King, the Son of God, he has stepped into our world to be the doctor that we so desperately need. And these verses show us his diagnosis. These verses show us just how sin sick our hearts are. And he has come to offer himself as the cure. His death on the cross takes the sinful hearts of his people, takes the sinful hearts of anyone who repents and believes in him. And then Jesus offers them a heart transplant, a new heart, a righteous one, one which beats with the love and the laws of God rather than man. See, Mark wants us to see in these verses that the Pharisees tried to shepherd God's people with the externals of godless religion. But Jesus shows us in these verses that godly shepherding from him looks like addressing the internal needs of a sinful heart. That has to be the message of the gospel. That has to be the mission of the church to speak of the savior who died on the cross. So our sinful hearts could be forgiven and cleansed. And so as I close, if you sit here this evening as someone who does follow Jesus, then you can sit here as someone who knows the full assurance that comes with the salvation that he gives you. If you sit here this evening as someone who follows Jesus, you can know the new heart that beats within you. The one that understands that this is the state of your heart, as Jesus described it in chapter 7 of Mark. Someone who understands the need for forgiveness. Someone who understands and accepts the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And someone who knows that your heart is becoming more and more aware over time as to just how true these verses are, just how sinful we are, and just how much Jesus has done to save us, forgive us, and rescue us. And for all of us this evening, whether we have already received this heart transplant from Jesus, or whether we are still not convinced and we're still thinking about it for ourselves. Please, let's recognize the sinful state of our own hearts. Let's recognize that when Jesus speaks in verse 21, 22, and 23 of chapter 7, he's not describing someone else. He's describing you, and he's describing me. Let's understand that there is nothing that we could ever do that would wash our hearts clean. But instead, let's understand that every single day, forgiveness can only ever come through Jesus, our doctor, who has come to rescue us. 
let's understand that that forgiveness can only come as we bow the knee to him, as he graciously and generously, with all of the love and forgiveness that we could ever need, gives us a new heart, a transplanted heart, one that loves him and honours him instead. Much more that could be said. Let me stop there and let me just pause for a minute. I'll invite the band back up onto the stage. And then after just a minute of reflection, let me pray. And I'll pray exactly what we've been seeing through Mark chapter 7, that we'll understand the needs for our hearts to be replaced by one which Jesus can give us. I'll pray that we'll understand that sin isn't something out there that affects us, but it's something that we produce from our hearts and something that Jesus so desperately needs to deal with and yet so generously and wonderfully offers to deal with. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, and we thank you that he exposes the false, destructive, empty nature of external religion and following rules and commandments that were made up by men. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you that he instead shows us our true needs for our hearts, our sinful hearts to be forgiven. Father, please help us to understand the seriousness of our sin. And yet help us to understand the sufficiency of the salvation that you give us. Father, for those of us who are here tonight who love you, help us to leave feeling assured, wonderfully assured at the new heart that you have given us. And for those of us, Father, who don't yet know you, please help us to understand that this is how we are rescued. This is how we are saved from judgment and from your wrath. All these things we pray in the name of our kind and loving Messiah King, the Son of God, Jesus. Amen.